Somebody say sound judgment. sound judgment. But to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Somebody say function. function. Verse number five says, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If, proper, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, and he who gives with liberality, and he who leads with diligence, and who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Yes, yeah. Title for the lesson is With Great Power Comes Great Responsibility. Yeah. Right. With great power comes great responsibility. Take the seats, take the seats. This morning we're gonna look at the book of Romans, which is one of my favorite books, and it is so for a number of reasons, but I could talk all day about chapters 1 through 11, but when we get to chapter 12, y'all have heard me talk about this before, in a lot of Paul's writings, he can, you can break his letters into two parts. The first part being doctrinal, and the second part being practical. The first part being um, our position in Christ, and the second part being our practice in Christ. The first part, you could call it, uh, what we believe in Christ, and the second part is we could call it um, how we are to behave in Christ. And I, and I found that I like these passages about how we're supposed to behave because in the Church of Christ, a lot of times all we talk about is what we're supposed to believe. Come on, now. we spend so much time talking about we the right church and the one church and the true church. At one point, I realized when I became of age, all I knew how to do was argue with folks about what church they should go to. And we don't spend enough time talking about what kind of people we should be in that church. So we can go out and we can fight and argue with people and convince them to join our church, but when they show up, they don't want to stay because the people ain't no good. So I like these kind of passages that talk about how we're supposed to live because, you know, we got all these self-help books and TV shows and seven steps for this and six steps to that. So, you know, I just believe that the best way to become a better person we can find right in this book. So in chapter number 12, I considered starting at verses 1 and 2. And some of you may remember Brother Roden preached a fantastic debut sermon on verse 1 and 2 just a year or so ago. And I went back and I listened to it and I said, he preached it so well, wasn't nothing left in there for me to say. So now I've got to wait a couple years till everybody forgets and then I can go back and re-preach it. So I'm just going to start at verse number three. Look at the text. Verse three, the Bible says, for 
Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted each a measure of faith. The New American Standard says to think, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. The New Living Translation says don't think you are better than you really are. And the Homeboys Translation says check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> You ain't, you ain't gonna find that in the Bible app. It's not there. It's from the Gospel of Ice Cube. Uh, check yourself before you wreck yourself. This statement is necessary because before you can figure out how God can use you, you have to be real with yourself about who you really are. All right, talk to Look us. at it. It says, do not, think of more self, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Why? Because you should have sound judgment. Or some translations say you should be sober minded. Sober minded in the Greek is a word sophroneo and it means to think with self-control. It's to have control over how you think. And actually one of the root words in sophroneo is friend is where we get our English word diaphragm from. Now diaphragm is the muscle that sits below your lungs and as you breathe it expands and contracts to help push your air out. So if you ever hear someone say you need to sing from your diaphragm the idea is that if you are not, you're not controlling the air, right. right? Whether it's true or not, the idea when you hear someone say that is that if you're not singing from the diaphragm, you're not controlling the air, how you sound, right. your notes, you're just, sing, you're just singing. Yeah. And just like the diaphragm can control the way you sound, how you think can control how you act. Well, talk to us now. So, so, so if we have to keep our mindset under control, if you haven't leveled with yourself with who you really are, you don't know what you need to work on. You don't know what you're good at, and you don't know what you're bad at. Right. So, so and the reason this is important, the reason Paul has to say essentially check yourself before you wreck yourself, is because we have a tendency to overvalue ourselves. Yeah. When we look at ourselves, a lot of times we see what we want to see, but not what's actually there. I mean, I mean, man, we can be overweight, bad back, two bad knees, but somehow we think we're just as fast as we were in college. We watch sports on TV, we think I could take them. I could, I could take them. Just like LeBron, we think our hairline is in the same place it was five years ago. It's because we see what we want to see, what's not actually there. Watch me, watch me mess with the women. You know, some of us, I mean, I, I'm willing to bet you that somebody's driver's license has the same weight on it when you first got it. I bet you, if we pulled everybody in this room and the correct driver's license in here, so the chance of one, two, and two a long time ago. Um, thought I weighed 20 pounds less than I actually did. I mean, some about the mirrors. You can get dressed, you can talk to yourself, like, okay, weight loss. Come through, I said, I see you weight loss. Some about the mirrors, boy. But the, but the reality comes when you see yourself in a photograph. You see a picture of yourself, and uh, you be like, who's that? That ain't me, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. And don't let it be off guard either. That means you ain't had a chance to turn to your good side. See, ladies, I don't think I knew about the good side. Every lady has a good side. They swear up and down. Don't, mm -mm. Let me get to my good side. And fellas, we can't. You know how we uh, hold our breath and try to turn that gut into muscles? We'll be like, Shh. Right? Something about, something about the, the, our reflection in the mirror. But when you look at a picture, what you see is what you get. And Paul is saying, when you look at yourself, forget about the reflection. I need you to take a photographic assessment of yourself. I need you to be honest, because if you're not, congratulations, you played yourself, because God, that's a major key. That's another one, that's a major key. If you're not honest with yourself, congratulations, you played yourself, because God can see the real you 24 seven. 
We can't fool God with no waist trainers, no flat tummy tees, brothers. We can't just put on a suit jacket and cover up the. No, God sees the real us all the time. He knows us better than we know ourselves. So He's waiting on us to be honest enough to figure out what He has blessed us with and how He can use us. So, you know, sometimes. Hmm, Sometimes we spend so much time being fake. We don't know who the real us is. And not only is our problem overconfidence, sometimes there's a flip side, our problem is underconfidence. You know, our problem is not always arrogance and too much confidence in our abilities, but sometimes we're too nervous, too afraid, we don't trust God enough to really step out on faith. Let me give you an example. Anytime you list the great leaders, great servants, great men of God in the Bible, Moses will always be on the list. I mean, Moses was so great of a man. Last summer, I went to Branson and paid good money to see a play about him. I mean, Moses died thousands of years ago, and I paid money to see a play about Moses. However, in the Old Testament, when God approached Moses and said, I want you to be the man to lead my people out of bondage. Moses said, mm-mm, Come on. not me. You got the wrong one. Three different times Moses said to God, I can't do it. I don't know why you're asking me, God. I'm, I'm not uh, powerful in speech. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just, I can't speak well enough. How am I supposed to rally the troops and lead our people? How am I supposed to convince Pharaoh to let us all go? I can't do it. However, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen says, Moses was mighty in words. Come on now. That's yeah. Acts 7, 22. So which one was it? Obviously, we know how it worked out for Moses. So he was mighty in word and deed, like Stephen said, but he thought he wasn't. Yeah. And just like Moses, how many of us have not tapped into the power within us? How many of us have not really stepped up to the plate because we too afraid? When all the time, just imagine if Moses ran from God. How different would the Bible look? And look at our own lives. How different would they look if we don't tap into the power of the God we serve? So, mm, look at verse number three again. I'm going to read it one more time. For through the grace given to me, I say, to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Now this is why we need to have sound judgment. This is why we need to be sober-minded, because God has allotted to each of us a measure of faith. The word allotted here simply means to divide into parts as needed. And measure means exactly what we think it means and measure. That means when God gave it our faith, he, he put it in a cup. He measured it. He shook off the extra. He took a knife and scraped the extra off. And this can be difficult to understand because if God is the one who allots to each, another word for a lot could be assigned. If God is the one who assigned to each a measure of faith, what about if I think he gave you more faith than he gave me? It can be easy to be jealous and envious of other people if I think you got more faith than I did. Right. But how many of you know that God don't make no mistakes? So if God is the one who assigns to each a measure of faith, that means that the faith I got is exactly what I need. You know, you know how many of us have ever done a budget? We sit down to pay our bills, we do a budget. Right? And when you do a budget, you look at how much money you made, and you look at how much you got to spend, and hopefully the first number is more than the second number. Um, I've been on the other side of that, it ain't pretty, it's not fun. But when you do a budget, you look at all the stuff you have to pay for, but all of your bills do not cost the same amount. Now your rent or your mortgage may be 30% of your income. Your car may be 10%, 15%. Your cell phone may only be 5%. But don't pay either one of them and see what happens. <laughs> don't pay your $50 Boost mobile bill and see what your credit gets jacked up. 
Just because one does not cost as much as the other one does not mean it's not important. Do you see? So, so I, as a matter of fact, help me out. Somebody say, what God has given me, what God has given me is, all I need. is all I need. So even if I feel like you got more faith than me, I'm going to be happy with the faith that I got because yeah. God gave it to me and it's all I need. Yes, so, and, and, you know, we, we love to say that, um, you know, the grass ain't greener on the other side. Come on, be happy what you got. Grass ain't greener. I don't. I don't believe that. Sometimes it is. <laughs> Sometimes. I mean, my neighbor pays good money. The true green man be out there twice a month. Her grass look like a golf course, and my grass. <laughs> Sometimes you can look through the fence and see exactly how green the grass is on the other side, but what you can't see is how much the water bill is. <laughs> You can see how green the grass is, but what you can't see is how much it costs to maintain, what it what it takes to keep it up, and and we not and I'm, I'm definitely not willing to pay or do the work to make my yard look like my neighbors. And a lot of times we can be jealous of other folks because we see what they got and what we have not considered is if I had the faith that they had, could I handle the responsibility that comes with it? We didn't even consider that. We're just looking at other folks. Thinking, man, I would, and little did we know they could be looking right back at us Come on. and saying, I wish I had the life they had. Come on, man. I wish I didn't have the responsibility and the pressure and Come the weight on. of my shoulders right. and the things that God sends me through because of the faith He's given me. We never know. Right. Help me out again. Somebody say, What God has given me, what God has given is, me. All is all I need. You know, I'm going to give one more point on this. And uh, I have a co worker who. Me and him ain't friends. We not cool. It's not somebody felt me. Yeah, she felt she felt we are not cool. And it's just like, I just feel like he don't have like all of the stuff that I think a man should have that I stand for, he ain't got none of that. And I'm sure he don't like me as much as I don't like him because he feel the same way. We just different. And what makes it so bad is that our parking spots are right next to each other. <laughs> and we both drive late 2000s black cars. At least we did until about two, three weeks ago. He showed up in a brand new 2018 sports car. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm hating. I was this close to being jealous. I was like, we used to basically have the same car, and now all of a sudden, my car is 10 years old and his is brand new. He making me look bad. I'm driving the family sedan, and now I got to park next to the Batmobile every day. <laughs> and I almost got like the old me would have let the wind just catch my door when I opened it. <laughs> been jealous. Okay. It's just me. Okay. So, you know, I I had to, you know, come to grips with it. And finally, I asked him, I said, hey, man, you get a new car? Come to find out. Obviously, I knew we got it. I'm just trying to be nice, polite. So I said, hey, you get a new car? Come to find out. The only reason he got a new car is because the transmission on his old car went out. And by the time he would have paid, it got it fixed. It would have cost more than the car was worth. So he didn't plan to get a new car, but he had to get one. Now here I was about to be jealous of what he had. Because he should have been jealous of what I got. Because I said, man, my car is paid for it. He said, so was mine. But not anymore. So I should have been jealous. I should have been thankful. Because what I got is exactly what I need. My car ain't broke, it's paid for, it's mine, and if it ain't broke, I ain't trying to fix it. I'm going to just roll my 2008 till the wheels fall off, because what God has given me is exactly what I need. So let's look at the text again. Let's look at the text, and now we can start the sermon. Um, I'm going with the introduction. 
So as I looked at this, I mentioned earlier that self-help books and magazines and TV shows and Fix My Life and all that stuff, that's all the rage. So as I thought about this text and I wrote this lesson and I said, how can I simplify this and break it down into the easiest way possible so that we can digest and actually remember all this stuff I'm saying today. I came up with three steps to maximizing your spiritual gifts. Three steps. I'm not going to I'm not gonna give them all to you at the same time, so you got to stay awake. But um, <laughs> look at verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Step number one is find your lane. All right. Somebody say find your lane. Find your lane. Yeah. So um, this, is, this text is pretty straightforward. There's nothing fancy in the original language or anything like that. It's comparing our physical bodies to the body of Christ, just as we have many members each member has a different function. The word function just means duty, or my favorite translation is responsibility. And we all understand that. While there are different members in the body, each member does not have the same function. But it can be hard to figure out what your function is. Now, we can read about certain gifts in the Bible, like teaching, preaching, serving, and giving. But, but you're not going to see social media ministry in the Bible. That's not there nowhere. And, and the, the needs of the church are constantly changing. I can remember barely 10 years ago, sitting in Bible class, watching people argue over whether or not uh, it's proper for a Christian to have social media. But fast forward to today, forget about the Christians. If your church is not active on social media, you're seen as being old school, you're seen as being stubborn, you're seen as though like all you do is knock on doors like it's the 50s and you're not trying to do as much as you can to reach the generation uh, currently. And I'm saying all that to say that what the body needs constantly changes. Right, yeah, yeah. So what my function is today may be different in the future. And if you don't know what your function is, you just got to hold on because it may not even exist yet. Right. So, so, you know, there's a story... Some of you know, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and share. This is weird, because I don't like talking about myself, but here I am. Um, so, most of you know, I'm involved in a couple different ministries. Most of you, obviously, you see what I do every week. Um, I stand over here, and I drink water, and I make noise <laughs> in a microphone. And, but what you may not know is just barely five years ago, I had never sang a day in my life. Right. Honestly, I thought I could not sing. Yeah. So what happened was, in the church I grew up in, it was never no bass mic. <laughs> I had never seen anybody sing bass the way I do. Mm -hmm. The only song leaders I had ever sang only sang tenor. Yeah. And since my voice is too low, I can't sing tenor, so I thought I couldn't sing. I thought I was just cursed and some low, just whatever. So all of a sudden, shortly after we started Greater Metro, we went from one song leader to two song leaders. And now that we had two, whoever would sing lead, the other one would sing bass. And all of a sudden, I was like, yeah. That's my wheelhouse, right? I mean, I can hit all the notes, right? That's for me. Right? And while this was happening, I started to pay attention more. I started to follow along more in song service because I finally felt like I knew what I was supposed to be doing right. instead yeah. of just singing weird off-key stuff. <laughs> so I would pay attention and listen and follow along, follow along, but after a while, for whatever reason, we went from two song leaders back to one. And if you ever grown out of something, you know it's difficult to try to fit back into it. And the first couple of weeks was rough after we went back to one song leader. It just was empty, it didn't sound right. It's just that, that wasn't what we were used to anymore. So at that point, I saw a void that needed filling. And I looked around the room and I said, I might be the only person in this room 
who could fill this void. So now I have a decision to make. Am I going to speak up, make myself available for God to use me? Am I going to step outside of my comfort zone? Or am I going to sit back, be quiet, sit on my hands? Come on, come on. And just, obviously, you see what direction I chose. You Amen. see how it worked out. Amen. But my point is, when you find a way to use your gifts, it's up to you to make yourself available. But what if, what if, in the time leading up to that, I was frustrated. What, so, okay, we in this new congregation. I was involved in X, Y, Z in my old church. Those ministries don't exist anymore. What if I've been trying to find my way? What if I've been trying to figure out how to get in where I fit in and it just wasn't happening for me? What if I quit? What if I gave up? What if I left while we still had two song leaders? I would have missed the opportunity that came when we went back to one. And in your story, it's not always going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to be frustrated. Sometimes you're going to be trying to find a way for God to use you when it just seems like it's not happening. I mean, maybe you, you'll, you'll try to start a ministry or you'll take an idea to the leadership and they'll say, you know, we don't think you're the right person to lead this. They'll say, maybe, but right now it's not, just not the best time. Or, or maybe you have an idea that you try to run with and nobody else is as enthusiastic as you are. So it never gets off the ground. But if you quit, if you give up, if you leave too early, you may miss your opportunity yeah, right. to find your way. Right. Yeah. 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 You ready for step number two? Yes, sir. Step number one was what? Find your way. Okay, I'll put this. I like that. Look at verse number six. The Bible says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. I love the word, I guess rather the definition of the word gifts. In the Greek it is charisma. And it simply means undeserved favor. Unmerited favor. You know, a lot of times we act like uh, we gave ourselves our own gifts. <laughs> You know, it's easy. If I can do something, you can't. It's easy for me to look at you like it's your fault. You can't do what I do, or vice versa. I mean, we act like God put all the gifts out on a table, and we just beat everybody else to them and took all the good gifts. But the very definition of gift is something you got that you didn't deserve. And we act like just because I can do something you can't, you also can't do something that I can do. Point number two. Step number one was what? A plus. Step number two is once you find your lane, stay in. You know, I was having a, um, I was having a conversation with my dad this a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about what it takes to be successful as a song leader. Um, not what I do, that's backup, but like what Brother Avery does. And we were just talking about it, and he said to me, you know, I think you'd be a great song leader. And I was like, no. But I didn't think much about it, because I mean, I'm your son. Like, of course you think. I can do it, if anybody. But then he shared with me his reasoning behind it. It made a lot of sense. He said, it seems like everything I've seen you do, you excel at. So I just feel as though if you put your mind to being a song leader, you could become phenomenal at it. And I thought about that and I said, you're still wrong. <laughs> and while I hate to burst your bubble, as much as I would love to believe that's true, I mean, as much as I would love to believe that I'm just so smart, so, so gifted, and so blessed, and I'm so talented and so favored that everything I do, I excel at. I said, it only looks that way because I only do things where I know I can succeed. I said, I only do things where I know there's a good chance I can be successful. Now, you may be thinking, I just heard you say you started singing and you never sang a day in your life before, which is true. However, ever since I was in middle school, I played a bass instrument, and I was good, like first chair good. But once you get out of school, there's nowhere to use that. 
I mean, I'm not just in my house with a tuba. <laughs> It's not cool anymore. But but when I heard bass in the church, it made sense to me. I said, all these years I spent practicing, learning music. Here's another way for me to use it. <laughs> and in your life, when you figure out how to stay in your lane, when you figure out how to operate within your purpose, when you figure out how to do what God has for you and how to leave that other stuff alone, yeah. it can start to look like all you do is win. Mm -hmm. It can start to look like from a distance when people look at you, everything you touch prospers. Mm -hmm. Every venture you take on is successful. Mm -hmm. And when you have the opportunity, you can tell them, it ain't got nothing to do with me. Right. I just learned how to use what God has given yeah. This is the beauty of the body of Christ and the way it's set up because all I have to do is what I'm good at. So if your job is to be the feet, be the best feet you can be. I mean, walk when the body needs you to walk, run when it needs you to run, hop when you need to hop, skip if you need to skip, jump when you need to jump, but quit trying to pick up stuff if you ain't got no fingers. <laughs> We got to the hands. <laughs> Can we explore that for a minute? Yeah. Okay. What's point number two? What's point number two again? Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. So sometimes staying in your lane means getting out of one you should never have been in in the first place. Right. You ever seen somebody on team too much? I mean, it's all, every time you look at them, they got their hand in something else. They doing what they doing too much. <laughs> Just doing too much. And it can be tricky because sometimes we confuse being active with being productive. Uh, sometimes we confuse activity with productivity. And just because you're doing something, don't mean. So, so I want to be clear though, it is not about our intentions. Whether or not you're doing too much don't have nothing to do with where your heart is. Right? Because let's think about it. We know some people, they just like to be safe. They like to be up front. They like to be involved. Whether they consider themselves leaders or elite or whatever it is, every time something new happens, they write front and center. On the other hand, some people are just overachievers. They, they naturally tend to juggle a lot of different things. Or some people are just genuine servants. Maybe they feel as though somebody's gotta do it, may as well be me. Or ain't nobody else gonna do it, so I'm gonna do it. But whatever my intention is, if you ever see me trying to preach, pray, sing, read announcements, pass communion cups, say the doxology, pick up the chairs and put away the trash, it does not make me a better servant. What it makes me is selfish. Well, well, stay there, stay there. This don't have nothing to do with where my mind is. It's all about divine design. I'm explaining it in a minute. Likewise, ladies, if you're trying to lead every committee on the women's ministry, if you're trying to take the pictures and count the money and write the minutes and post on the social media and pass out the baskets and drive the bus when y'all go on trips, it is not. Y'all laughing like it's true. Like I, know somebody. I didn't say that. I mean. But if that's you, it does not make you an honor roll Christian. You don't get extra credit for taking all the jobs. What it makes you is counterproductive. Why? Because God's divine design for his body is not for a minority of the people to do a majority of the work. You know, let me give this illustration. One of my co-workers, just a couple of years ago, I worked in a school district and I was in a classroom and I noticed she was limping around. So I said, you know, what's going on? You're all right. She said, I have a bad hip. I need uh, hip surgery. 
And to be honest, she needed hip surgery for a couple of years. And even though she's a teacher who gets two months off every year, she would rather spend those two months vacationing with her family than recuperating from a surgery. So she put it off as long as she could until finally the doctor said, you have no choice but to get this hip replaced. So she went ahead and did it, and then when we all came back from the summer, the next time I saw her, I said, how's your hip? And she just shook her head. Now, I assumed the issue was with the hip. So I said, is everything all right? Did the surgery not go? And she said, no, my hip is fine, but now I got two bad knees. She said, I put off getting my hip fixed for so long, the body is not designed to walk with one good hip. So in order for me to walk, I had to shift my weight, and I put more pressure on my knees. My knees had to overcompensate. And now when all I had initially was a bad hip, now in addition to hip replacement, I gotta have double knee replacement. And in the body, if you're doing more than you're supposed to be doing, you just like them knees. I mean, you can get away with it for a while. You can overcompensate for a while, but eventually you'll end up tired, broken, and busted just like the hip. And on the flip side, if you're somebody who don't want to do nothing, then you're causing other people to have to overcompensate for you. When all we should have to do in the first place is worry about what God has for us. So even if all you do is pick up trash, then that means at least no one else had to do it. Right, right. No one else had to teach Sunday school and pick up the trash. Right. No one else had to sing and pick up the trash. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how big or how small you perceive your job to be, we all have a part to play. Right. I got one more. Thank you. <laughs> You'd be a hype, Brother Crutchfield. <laughs> Nobody else. You'd be back there punching the air. And... <laughs> I like that energy. You forgot. You know, some... One other thing when it comes to staying in your lane, sometimes we've got to realize when it's time to let someone else take over our lane. You know, we talked earlier about how stuff is always changing. Just because my ministry is one thing today, it doesn't mean it's supposed to be my ministry until I die. And I learned that church folks are territorial with the ministries. I mean, walk in the church kitchen and touch the wrong thing. And the, the church ladies in the kitchen don't play. Don't play. <laughs> you know about the kitchen. So, so you know... I'm willing to bet if you look hard enough in every church, you can find a ministry that's suffering because the wrong person is right. leading it. Yes. Yes. I mean, maybe you aren't always the wrong person, but I'm willing to bet if you look hard enough, you'll find out that Brother So-and-So been running the AB ministry since 19... 86 when the sermons were still on cassette tapes and, and he doing good just to burn CDs now but if you like me and it's 2018 I don't even have a CD player I stream all my music and well brother so and so is just doing the best he can he still got a flip phone he don't know what a podcast is it's just and there's nothing against hypothetical brother so and so but just because something was for you at one time doesn't mean it's going to be for you forever. And, 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 and usually, when you see these situations, it's because one of two things. The person in charge doesn't realize it's time for them to step away and move in a new direction, or everyone else is too afraid to say something to them. Normally, it's part of both. And my prayer for me is that when it's my time, to move aside, I can do just that. Right. Like we need some folks who ain't gonna be stingy with the ministries. I mean, at one point we had to get our start. 
So we need to be able to recognize when, when it's time to just get ourselves out of the way and let somebody go. We, we, we need to be able to say, I, I don't have nothing against you. I got no ill will. I wish you all the success. I know I had some success, so if you need me, I'm going to be here to help you right. along the way. We need that in the church because just because something was our lane at one point doesn't mean it's going to be our lane forever. Right. 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 Yeah. Step number one was right. find your lane. Step number two was Stay ready for step number three? Yes, sir. Let's look at six, seven, and eight again. Verse 6 says, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving. Or he who teaches in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. And he who gives with liberality. And he who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Step number three is the easiest of all of them. Once you found your lane, once you figured out how to stay in it, the only thing left for you to do is accelerate. All right. You know, we talked earlier about the great thing about the body of Christ is all you have to do is what you're good at. All you have to worry about doing is you. Right? And that should take so much pressure off of us because I don't have to try to out-preach the preacher because that's his gift. I don't have to try to out-teach my mom because that's her gift. I don't have to try to out-motivate my dad because that's his gift. I don't have to out-sing Avery because that's his gift. I don't have to out-encourage my wife because that's her gift. But when I find what's for me, I'm going to do it so well. Other folks are going to feel the same way. Look at a bass mic when I'm in the room. Right. If anybody wants to step up, go ahead. But that's the mentality we should have. I'm going to do what I do so well. And when it's my time to step away, I'm okay with that. Because it ain't about me, it's about the body. Is that alright? Step number one was what? Two was, and once you do, you do what? Accelerate. Accelerate. There we go. Same to your feet. Same to your feet. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So, when I was a kid, my favorite superhero was Spider-Man. Peter Parker. So I, I still remember being in like third or fourth grade and before we had like cell phones and internet and tablets, me and my sister would get home off the bus and we had like a little free time before we had to do homework and stuff. And I remember every day at four o'clock on whatever channel, the Spider-Man cartoon would come on. I would rush home and eat my snack or whatever, watch Spider-Man. And if you're not familiar with the character, Spider-Man is a person by the name of Peter Parker. Peter Parker was a high school student who was, if I had to describe him with one word, I would say he's just average. Um, he could, he certainly was not popular. There was nothing special about him. He could walk into a room and back out of it and nobody would notice. Um, not only so, he was kind of an oddball. He didn't really fit in. He was on the outside looking in as far as groups of his peers, and he was trying to find his way. So one day while they're on a science field trip, he gets bitten by a radioactive spider. And this is the event that changes him. You know it, thank you, William. I'm here, I feel you in that one. You like Spider-Man, yeah. So obviously the thing that changes his life is him being bitten by a radioactive spider. But like most things, the change is not immediate. He doesn't go to sleep, Peter Parker, and wake up Spider-Man. It takes time. He goes through growing pains, so to speak. So as he's learning more about himself, he begins to notice things he didn't always realize were there. He begins to find new abilities. 
in his case, he has more strength and more endurance and more focus and more agility. So as he's finding all of these new gifts, now he's trying to figure out how am I supposed to use these? So he says, I'm gonna try my hand at wrestling. So at one point he shows like this raggedy costume and he tries his hand at uh, amateur wrestling and he's actually good, he wins. Like to be a little skinny high school kid, he's a good wrestler. He wins the match and on the way home, he witnesses a burglary and it becomes apparent to him very quickly that while he could have success fighting people, his skill set was better used serving and saving people. So, but now that he realizes this about himself, he's still struggling because he says, I didn't ask for this. I didn't want to be no savior. I didn't want to spend all my time helping and serving people. I was just trying to be me. Now I'm tasked with this, with this weight on my shoulders of trying to save the entire city. And it was not until something his uncle said to him, get home. And his uncle said, with great power comes great responsibility. Say that one more time. With great power comes great responsibility. Get ready for the connection. I want to submit to you that in this room there are two types of people. Peter Parker's and spider man Just like Peter Parker, some of us are average. Just like Peter Parker, some of us are, you know, oddballs, misfits. When it comes to the body of Christ, we're on the outside looking in. Maybe on Sunday morning when you're trying to decide if you should go to church, the devil whispers to you, don't even bother. I mean, ain't nobody going to miss you if you don't show up. You're not important. Just like Peter Parker, some of us deal with that. But also just like him, when we figure out what our gifts and our abilities are, will we use them? You know, just like in his case, he had to decide, will I use these gifts fighting people or saving people? And my charge to everyone to hear this morning is, whether you realize it or not, once we figure out what we're good at, we're going to use them. Because people always end up doing what they're good at. Whether you like it or not, whether you are passionate about it, we just naturally find a way to do what we're good at. So if you can sing like nobody's business, will you spend all your energy singing for your YouTube channel? Or will you find a way to use your gift for the one who ultimately gave it to you? If you If you are a skilled leader and motivator and organizer, will you spend all of your time being a supervisor for whatever company you work at? Or will you use those talents leading a ministry? If you are a nurturer and a caretaker, will you spend all your energy trying to turn a bad boy into a good man? Or will you find somebody in the church who's younger than you in the faith that you can mentor yeah. and disciple and help yeah. grow? Right. And, and, and I, I don't, it doesn't matter how old you are, how long you've been here. It doesn't matter how young you are, how inexperienced you are. At some point, We've got to decide to make the jump from average to super. All right. So if you still a Peter Parker on this morning, my charge to you is whatever excuse that you got, get rid of it. Because we're this close to moving into a new facility, and opportunities for ministry are just going to explode. And for this year or however long we've been in the coffee house, a lot of us have been able to get by just coming and going showing up and going home. And if we take this same attitude into our new place of worship, Come on. it ain't gonna cut it. So one last time I ask you the question, what's keeping us from making the jump from average to super? I'm done. Come on. Yes, he has smiled on